Hello friends. I'm going to be doing something a little bit differently. Once a month, I'm going to be shouting out a book that I've read recently that's published by an independent author. The writing community that I've encountered on Twitter, on Instagram, is amazing. And independent authors really deserve our recognition. So I just want to shout out books that I've read recently by independent authors that are fantastic. We should be talking about them more. We should be reading them too. Um, traditional published authors, they have a team of PR agents that are promoting their books and independent authors a lot of times can't afford that. So we really like to give back to our community by talking about each other's work. So that's what I'm going to be doing today. I will be coupling that usually with something that relates to the book that I read. It just makes it a little bit more fun for everybody. Today, I'm really excited to shout out A Court of Sugar and Spice. I will link her down below. She has an Etsy site where you can buy her books that are signed in really amazing gift boxes with some fun swag. Um, and today, in honor of A Court of Sugar and Spice, I'm going to be making Christmas sugar plums these balls. So one thing that Rebecca is really amazing at is she writes romance books that are retellings. Um, the first one that I read of her was a retelling of The Headless Horseman. This one is a retelling of The Nutcracker. If you're not thirsty, I don't even know what to tell you. Now I'm going to try not to spoil the story too much, um, but I will tell you that it is very spicy. If you are one who is really into a lot of descriptions of sex, I would not recommend this book to you. But however, if you're on board with that, then buckle up. So we're gonna start by doing two cups of walnut halves for this recipe of sugar plums. So our story follows two sisters. It's a dual point, first person point of view perspective of Louisa and Clara. They really give me sort of Marianne and Eleanor Dashwood vibes. I really love stories that have strong bonds between sisters and really talks about their dynamic with each other. Clara is a little bit more of a level-headed one. She's the artist, you know, and usually the voice of reason because Louisa is the feisty one who likes herself a good time. And one thing I, appreciated about this story is the author doesn't shy away from making these girls you know human beings in the time that it's set women are really like not allowed to enjoy sex or kissing or anything like that this author doesn't shy away from pointing out that that's a bunch of bull that women definitely have appetites and needs and those needs could be one person, it could be male, it could be female, it doesn't matter. You know, be proud of it. And I love that about Louisa. She's feisty, and but also fiercely loyal and protective of her family. So how this story begins is Louisa and Clara's father has died. So their mother died a long time ago, now they're all alone. And they go to live with their godfather, Drossel Meyer. They've never met this guy before, so they're a little bit nervous about it, but you know, they're ready for adventure, but they also know that time's coming where they're going to have to settle down and find husbands, and this guy is definitely going to help them because he got, he got that money. So they get to his house, and it's enormous, and they're overwhelmed, and then they realize, like, he's kind of a kooky guy. They've never met him before. I don't know if I said that. Um, and like, He's an inventor, he's very proud of it, and they do notice that, you know, looking around, there's no servants in the house. They're all, he calls them automatons, and they're basically like puppets that he's using to serve him as opposed to having like human people. And they're like, that's kind of weird, but okay, um, but also, you're going to help us find husbands? So one point in the story he's going around showing them all of his inventions and one of them is his prized possessions is this nutcracker doll that's real cute but then louisa accidentally breaks it she's like, oh. she's like i gotta 
I gotta fix this before he finds it. So she sneaks out and she finds the nutcracker and she goes to fix it. There's like a splinter broken off of it. But in the process of fixing it, she accidentally stabs herself and a piece of her blood gets onto the nutcracker. For the next part, I'm just gonna tell you, I'm gonna do a cup of chopped dates. Anyway, so Luis's blood gets into the nutcracker and then he comes to life. She's like, what? And the nutcracker proceeds to tell her that he's not just a nutcracker that has come to life with the magic of her blood. He's actually a fairy, but not just a fairy. He's a fairy prince. I mean, I feel like if I was in that situation, I wouldn't question it. This guy just came to life. He's telling me he's a prince. I would be like, show me your pot of gold. Wait, it's wrong fairy tale. He says that her, her godfather is actually this horrible, horrible person. And he has trapped him and a lot of his people and he needs their help. He says so very arrogantly. So that, you know, he can go free his people because the bad fairies are going to be destroying his people, led by the Rat King. Also, I just want to point out the way she describes the Rat King in this story was hideous and fantastic. <laughs> Louise is like, I mean, I'm down because I always like a good adventure. But of course, the sister's like, what? I'm going to go ahead and put the chopped dates. I'm putting them all in a food processor. The next thing I'm gonna do is I need a cup of dried apricots. I'm also gonna chop that up and put it in the food processor as well. I'm a little worried my food processor, once again, isn't big enough for all the things. Also, hi. They end up going through this portal to Fairyland to go free the prince and stuff. And he's not a big fan of these ladies coming with them because, you know, typical girls are gonna just hold him back, but then Louise is like, well, obviously you need my blood to be a person, so I would just step off, bro. They go into Fairyland, they gotta learn how to fight the bad guys, and then, you know, they have to take the prince to this pool, and he's gotta jump into it so that he can regain his powers as a fairy and save his people. But then that's where the trouble starts because then they get back into fairyland and of course all the bad guys are wandering around you know trying to take over the lands and then making sure the prince doesn't come back at one point clara gets taken by this like weird creature and she's like trying to escape him but then she can't and then he takes her off but then she gets rescued and she gets rescued by my bro the sugar plum fairy I love the way that the author describes the Sugar Plum Fairy because he's just a carefree, sucking on his candy cane, pink haired, lovely, lovely guy. I just want to point out he loves himself a good time. I don't even know if I'm allowed to say this on YouTube, but he has a very special quality about his secretions that come out of his body. And I'm just like, girl you wrote that and now i'm going i wish it was true in real life mm. now they've got themselves a little bit of a of an army get the prince to this pool so he can break this curse so he can save his people we get to know the characters we get to know about the dynamic between the sisters a little bit more in that in background and of sugar plum fairy and our fairy prince. And of course, romance happens. Is that spoiler free enough? I don't want to get into too much about what happens in the end, but it's nice. But these characters are badass. And I really like strong female characters. I love that they female characters that have agency outside of a man that they can be just as strong and and even just and even weak but it doesn't require a dude to you know make them let them know that's okay or to empower them somehow and this author really does a great job of you know giving all of these characters 
identities apart from the relationship that they're in. There's a lot of great character developments. And in such a short time that you really feel for them by the end of the story. And I'm really not always into stories with a lot of magic, but I did like the magic in this story. It's used sparingly. It's not used as an easy out. I am now going to start getting this all ground together because I'm, like I said, I'm a little afraid that it's not all going to fit. Okay, we're going to add a little more. I really, after the last time I had an incident like this, I really should have maybe got a bigger food processor. But, you know, what do I know? Yikes! Alright, so I've got my walnut hubs, my dates, my apricots. I'm now going to zest an orange. And then I'm going to put in some seasonings into this food processor. I've never zested an orange before, um, but I know you gotta just stick to the orange part and not go too deep, unlike what Clara did with her guy, if you know what I mean. When I first picked up this book, I knew there was going to be romance in it. What I was not prepared for was how steamy that romance was going to be, and she did a very good job of describing that the things that happened between our characters. I will warn you that there's some things that happen in this story that are borderline SA. Um, so if that's not something that you're into, I would just be cautious of that. I don't feel like the author ever went too far. I never kind of cringe. And I've definitely read stories where you weren't expecting it. Even in stories where you know bad things are gonna go down, like when there's a war, but sometimes the author goes a little bit too far you're just like ooh, I don't think that was quite necessary for the plot of the story I just need a little drink because I'm thirsty <sighs> now I'm gonna do some cinnamon every Thanksgiving I get another thing of cinnamon because I don't remember if I have cinnamon does anybody else do that cinnamon and spice and everything else. Okay, now I'm going to do a half of a teaspoon of nutmeg, and then I'm going to do a half a teaspoon of allspice. All right, and now I'm going to mix all of that together. I think for this next portion, I'm just going to put this in a bowl. It smells like Christmas. I bet that's exactly what the author intended for us with her delightful, delightful story. She really does have really amazing descriptions. It's one of the things the editor told me about. He's like, anytime you walk into a room, just like take a gander because you're reading it from the perspective of the character. So you're going to be seeing what they see. And then it really puts you like right into the story. So now I'm going to add a quarter of a cup of honey. So once again, I'm not going to spoil anything. I'm not going to tell you how it ends, even though it was great. But I will say that there is a sequel, and I understand it's kind of an Alice in Wonderland mashup retelling, and I am so excited about that because I love Alice in Wonderland. And I want to see what happens with our characters. And I also think that's a sign of a great author when you're like, oh, man. I don't want it to end. I want to know what happens. I want to know, you know, how these people's lives, like, really turn out. I know this wasn't, like, an in-depth critical discussion, but that's not the point. There's books out there that you don't hear about that I feel we need to give props to and we need to get more readers for. And it doesn't always have to be critical. You don't have to read every book and be like, oh, my God, this author is talking about the way our society is oppressing blah, 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 or like a social commentary on this and that. Sometimes that's okay. Sometimes you just want to read a book with some fairy smut and that's okay too. Okay. So now that I've got this mixed up, 
I am going to roll into bite-sized balls and then roll it in sugar. So I'm using a cane sugar that's like all sparkly and nice, just like our bro. Okay. Small bite size. I'm gonna use a tablespoon for this because I think it'll be easier. I mean, some people's bites are bigger than others, so I don't know how they can tell you exactly how big this is supposed these are supposed to be. I mean, I don't know if you can see how sparkly these are, but I think the sugar plum fairy would be very happy. Now here's the true test. I put those in my mouth anytime. <gasps> Thank you so much for being here, you guys. Again, this was a review of A Quart of Sugar and Spice. Please check out independent authors and join me also for talking about writing and world building in my fantasy series, The Daughters of Riverstone. The Rise of Riverstone is now available. And then book two, The Pride of Riverstone, next month. Thank you so much for being here. Bye.